Welcome everybody for the final webinar of 2022. Uh, I'm Gordon, I work at Hydroterra. Richard's currently on the road in some poor reception, so he's hoping to join us, but uh, we'll make do if not. Uh, so today's webinar is on smart cities and urban management, uh, urban water management tools, uh, future trends in urban water and inf information systems. Uh, firstly, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we meet today, the Binurong people of the Kapula Nation. I also pay my respects to their elders past and present. Uh, so today we're lucky to be joined by Warwick Bishop, who's the Director of Water Technology. And just a quick background on Warwick. Um, so he's the Director of Water Technology and has over 25 years of experience in surface water management. He has led a wide variety of projects covering areas such as flood risk management, water quality, sediment transport, coastal hazard, WSUD and, and environmental flows. Warwick has an honours degree in civil engineering from the University of Melbourne and, and a master's of engineering science degree from Monash University. Um, investigating the detailed hydraulics of stormwater treatment wetlands. Uh, Warwick has experienced throughout Australia in both rural and urban contexts. Uh, Warwick has drawn on his extensive range of surface water modelling and management experience to, to develop the Water Information Systems team at Water Technology. This team is focused on integrating water data analysis, processing and information delivery to improve the way water is managed in multiple contexts. Um, like always, we enjoy uh, audience input. So if you have any questions throughout the webinar, um, there's a little Q&A button. Uh, you can press that and just type in any questions you may have, and we will try to get through them at the end of the webinar and hopefully have some answers for you. Um, so the, the purpose of these webinars um, is to share knowledge um, at Heart of Terror with consider ourselves specialists in um, monitoring um, services. Um, so yeah, these webinars are designed to sort of facilitate the education. Um, so we're able to lead the industry by understanding the needs of the industry. Um, so that's why, yeah, we look forward to hearing from you throughout the Q and A. Uh, so today's webinar, um, so Warwick will be sort of covering urban water management, what the challenges are, and then he'll sort of move on to uh, how we can improve urban water management through smart tools. Um, so Warwick, I'll throw it to you now. Great, thanks Gordon. Um, I'm really pleased to be here today to join Hyder Chair in this webinar. I actually um, know Richard from a long time back. We played hockey together about 30 years ago. So um, strangely enough, we ended up in similar or related related fields and um, really pleased to, to be able to present some info today in this webinar series. Um, so just to start off with um, really thinking about what are the urban water challenges in the, at the present time and also looking forward, there's really a lot of, um, I could sit stresses on the landscape, on that urban landscape. And here there's just an image you can see with, um, uh, I think this is Gardens Creek. So uh, what would have been originally a, a natural waterway has been completely channelised and in, turned into a concrete trapezoidal channel um, with uh, the commensurate sort of degradation in, in environmental values and amenity values. So that's that's a, a, a really detrimental consequence of urban development historically. We obviously don't do that now in greenfield areas, but that's sort of what's happened due to intensification and growing population in urban areas in the past. Um, not only is that imp impact on waterways, but there's an increase in flooding risk associated with urbanisation because greater, as, as people probably know, um, increased impervious areas leads to increased rates of runoff, particularly from short duration um, thunderstorm type events. And uh, the other impact that urbanisation has and, and increases in urbanisation over time is an impact on water quality. And that's related to um, not just the nutrients and sediment that comes off um, urban catchments into waterways, but also the timing of flows, the temperature of flows, the, the, the level of oxygen in the water, all those um, and, and things like heavy metals and so on that run off, um, come off road runoff, all those sort of things impact the, um, 
the, the water quality in streams and the health of the ecosystem in waterways. I keep going there. Right, and so in terms of thinking about what's the status of, of the urban environment in terms of surface water, uh, I think it's important to having that forward looking um, picture to, to really contemplate climate change. And that's something that as a community, uh, thankfully everyone's become more aware of, I think in, in recent years, it's been an issue for a long period of time, but it's becoming far more prominent in our thinking as a, as a broader community, not just as, as specialists in the water industry. But the key um, drivers, if you like, of change related to climate, um, the impacts of climate change into the future are twofold. The, the, the obvious one being that increase in temperature, which is the direct result of that increase in um, greenhouse gas in the atmosphere. And what that leads to in terms of the landscape is high evapotranspiration. Um, that leads to ecological stress for uh, plants and animals in the environment. And very significantly, there's um, a real risk going forward of increased um, human health impact through heat wave. And um, I'm sure everyone's seen sort of statistics and I don't have numbers off the top of my head, but we all know that going forward, there's likely to be far more of those extreme heat days, sort of above 40 type um, temperatures or even above 35. And under those circumstances, it's actually really significant human health impacts and um, leading to sort of people needing care, but also um, significant numbers of deaths are actually attributable to heat wave. And I think I, I saw something recently and I don't know the numbers, but the, the um, consequence of the heat wave recently in or earlier in the year in Europe, uh, where you had, I think, nearly 40 degree temperatures in the UK, for example, which is just um, hard to comprehend. Uh, there, there are, I think, tens of thousands of um, casualties in terms of people impacted by those things. So really significant impact uh, in heat. And uh, I'll come to this a, a bit later, I think, but the um, important aspect there in terms of water management is the ability for the way we manage the landscape in the urban context through vegetation and application of soil moisture and, and canopy cover and irrigation and so forth. There's an ability to actually have a significant impact on that, that heat signature going forward. Um, the other impact of, of that increase in, in temperature is a reduced water availability. So the expectation is that overall our climate's going to become drier. So our mean annual rainfall will, will likely reduce and that could have a very significant impact on the rates of yield from our, our storage reservoirs and our catchments. Obviously we've got something like the desal plant which can supplement our water supply, but that's a pretty expensive and not a, not a very environmentally um, sympathetic way to produce water. Uh, it's um, has some negative consequences. It's very expensive and it uses a lot of energy. So um, uh, it, it's not a it's not a, a sort of situation where we don't have to worry about water resources because we can just turn on the desal plant. Uh, if there's other ways we can supplement our water supply, then that's a far preferable outcome. Um, and the the sort of um, juxtaposing that decrease in overall rainfall is an increase in the intensity of rainfall. So although we may on average get less total rainfall uh, average year to year, there's a high likelihood or we know essentially that storm intensities are going to increase under climate change. And that's simply because um, if nothing else, a warmer atmosphere has a greater capacity to, to hold moisture. That's why we have much higher rainfall intensities in the tropics and you do in the temperate zones. And as everything warms up, that um, those sort of zones of, or, uh, of increased rainfall intensity actually move south. So, um, we in Melbourne, where where I am, uh, we're likely to experience sort of rainfall intensities that that we haven't experienced in the past that were associated with areas further to the north, and that has a big impact on urban flooding um, due to that that um, uh, low uh, perviousness of the catchment. The other impact of uh, climate change is sea level rise, and this um, does certainly does have a big impact on urban areas because so much of our urban population lives near the coast and coastal cities and a lot of coastal areas of coastal cities are in low-lying parts. So if you think about Melbourne, for example, uh, all along the, the south bank of the Yarra, South Melbourne, uh, Albert Park, all around that sort of area in, in uh, the Port Phillip Council region, uh, you've got all the low-lying areas out the back of um, 
between uh, Mentone and Frankston or um, through that sort of um, um, swamp area, yeah, the back swamp in behind the coastal dune, a lot of very low lying areas through there are all extremely um, uh, prone to inundation from um, tight, increased tidal levels and storm surge under a sea level rise. The other thing with increased sea level, you get increased erosion of beaches and loss of sand. So that, that requires either defence uh, defences to be put up to prevent erosion or things like um, beach renourishment, which there's a lot of that going on at the moment where sand's pumped from offshore up onto the beach, which again is, is pretty expensive. Thanks, Gordon. Um, so that's sort of the context, I guess, of, of where we're headed with the impacts of climate change, not just, we've got enough problems just with the urban environment as it is, it's just going to get worse with climate change looking forward. So there's certainly a big challenge there. In terms of data and information. Um, we can only really make decisions and, and move forward if we're well armed with information that enables us to make those decisions and undertake management operations and do things in the urban context that are going to improve the situation in terms of flooding or water quality or coastal inundation due to climate change. Uh, I think it's fair to say we live in an information age. You know, we're, 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 there's just data everywhere. We've got the internet. Uh, I'm old enough to remember uh, sadly, well before the internet and, and the only sort of source of information was the encyclopedia or the library or something. But now we're just, we've got information at our fingertips um, and, and it seems like there's data everywhere. The question I suppose is, um, do we have the right information or all the information we need to make the right decisions to improve um, amenity and uh, reduce risk and um, protect people, uh, life and property and the environment? Um, and in that context, what, what data do we need to make those decisions and where are the gaps? Um, this little image uh, you can see here is uh, a, rate, a 24 hour accumulated radar rainfall uh, plot. So all those colors represent um, cumulative rainfall. You can see it's up to in the, in the um, heaviest areas up to sort of maybe hundred mil in some of those intense spots. And this is rainfall caused by intense local thunderstorm activity. And this is, you can't quite see, but in the middle of that plot roughly is Tamworth. So this is in sort of Northwestern New South Wales. And the um, little dots you might be able to see around there, little black dots, uh, they're actually rain gauges. So all spread all around this area, and there's quite a lot of them, are, are rain gauges recording daily rainfall. Now, what becomes apparent when you look closely at this image is that None of those rain gauges essentially occur anywhere near the epicenter of any of those thunderstorms. So what's happened, if you just didn't have that radar rainfall information, you just looked at the gauges, you would essentially miss all these really localised intense thunderstorm activity and all the rain that occurred with that. So um, the, the important thing about data is that you need it, not just uh, the right parameter and, and, and the general locality, you need it actually at the right spot. And um, one of the big changes going forward with uh, information and, and our management in, in both rural contexts, but certainly in the urban area is remote sensing. Um, that's a really important source of data going forward. And uh, I think we're gonna be using that a lot more. Thanks, Gordon. So um, in terms of gathering that data and, and getting the right information, um, you know, how do we go about that? This is a, this example of a, a gauging station there. It's a typical setup with a, a concrete weir and a, and a, um, a gauge box and a um, gauge uh, markers down the side. Um, those sorts of things are pretty expensive to set up. And so uh, you tend to find, whether it's in rural catchments or urban catchments, um, permanent fixed traditional gauging stations such as these um, are not that numerous, if you like. Um, they're expensive to set up, they're pretty expensive main to maintain. So inevitably, particularly in urban areas, one of the biggest um, inhib inhibitors to accurate flood mapping, for example, is a lack of calibration um, gauge data that we can use to calibrate our models. So you'd find, for example, across urban Melbourne, where I'm most familiar with, um, virtually all of the urban flood models that are used to determine flood risk and drive planning outcomes across Melbourne, virtually all of those are uncalibrated models simply because there's not the gauging data available to properly calibrate those models. And that ultimately 
means we've got um, less confidence in the data that's being used. And that creates uncertainty and conflict when it comes to um, disseminating that flood information to the community because they they may not necessarily believe it or they dispute it or, or and, and there's also, you know, you really want to get that sort of thing right because it has a big impact on people. So uh, in terms of thinking about data then, well, what information do we have? We've got um, gauges, there's things like radar, um, but there's other sort of uh, sources of data that are coming on board now. The traditional information might be a bureau, the BOM is a Bureau of Meteorology. Um, you go onto their website, they've got um, rainfall gauges daily, there's pluvios, at, um, which is uh, five or 10 minute or half an hour increment rainfalls at automatic weather stations, which are spread around um, most of the capital cities and then around the country. But um, even in somewhere like as big as Melbourne, the Bureau of, Meteor Bureau of Meteorology only have a, a, a few, a handful of automatic weather stations. So there's a good chance that where you are, uh, if, if you are in Melbourne, that um, that you might have a, a, a automatic weather station two, three, five, ten kilometres away, which will give you reasonable information. It won't tell you exactly what's happening at your location. Melbourne Water has their own data. Um, councils sometimes have um, their own gauge uh, information and so forth. And then water utilities like the water supply companies or um, drainage authorities and so forth, or irrigation authorities have their own um, information as well. Where things are, are going potentially, there's a lot of discussion around the Internet of Things, the IoT, um, and the IoT utilizing essentially uh, low cost sensors that can be widely distributed and um, that information collected and utilized. I think uh, from my point of view, there's been a lot of promise around what IoT can do for the water industry, uh, sort of more broadly, but at this stage, um, I'd have to say it's it hasn't been widely adopted or utilised and there's still probably some question marks around how effective or, or what might be the best way to utilise IoT in the future because um, the, the there's issues around whilst the instruments are very cheap, um, they may not necessarily be as reliable. If you've got lots and lots of instruments out in the field, you need something that's fairly low maintenance because um, whilst the instruments themselves might be cheap, if it's going to cost you a lot of money to go out and maintain them and ensure that they continue to operate, then that um, that might be prohibitive in terms of the budget that authorities have got available for that. So, um, and what are the data networks in terms of how that data is captured and uploaded and then used as well, and the reliability uh, of an IoT device um, against a far more expensive, like the old, old school sort of um, gauge station that uh, you can see in the picture there. Um, you know, how much weight might you, you place on some data versus other data. There's also uh, looking forward, I think, um, you know, potential for sort of crowdsourcing of information. Um, you know, mobile phones are the ubiquitous smartphone these days um, with all sorts of apps and, and ways to upload information. So particularly in the flood space, one of the key pieces, pieces of information that we use for um, uh, flood calibration or, or not really calibration so much as validation. It's just to test whether we're, our models are performing well and we're predicting water to be in the places where it should be is using uploaded photos and videos um, from social media. So there's applications out there which will go and harvest images and, and information from social media and, and package it up. And you might be able to um, have access to hundreds or thousands of photos and video from a major storm that would, that would that would create this um, um, database, if you like, of information that you can then draw on to in order to um, to calibrate or to validate your model. So that's really a, a changing area. There's also things like citizen science type apps, which actually allow you to go and photograph something and tag it and upload it to a specific website. And that information might go into a database that can then be utilized as well. There's other sources, potential sources of information from things like, I know I've heard of, I don't know any details about this, but I, I am aware that um, someone um, might have been in Europe, I think was was looking at the potential for using um, the those sensors that that cars have, a lot of cars have now, the auto windscreen wiper sensors. Um, they have some sort of ability to capture the intensity of rainfall because it, it impacts on the speed of your, your wipers. So um, you think about thousands and thousands of cars with those sensors for, um, rainfall intensity, if you could turn that into some usable 
um, sort of information that might be another source for rainfall, for example. So there's interesting ways of capturing data that we, we possibly haven't even thought of yet that could be associated, way, associated with the distributed use of technology such as cars or phones or um, computers and, and so forth. Um, there's also, as I mentioned before, uh, I think going forward that remote sensing is going to become a more and more important data source. Uh, the, the, the purpose of remote sensing is really to, or, or not the purpose, but what it can provide is really filling the gaps between those point sources of data. So whether it's uh, rainfall in terms of radar um, can, can, is very effective at uh, creating a spatial vari variable pattern of rainfall in between gauges. Um, things like uh, satellite imagery that can detect uh, Water, uh, water extent, inundation extent, or can detect soil moisture, can detect things like um, plant uh, biomass or, or leaf, leaf area index type information around the, the, um, the status of, of vegetation. Can also, there can be infrared um, imagery and so on that can pick up heat and things like that, which, which will have a really important role in the future in managing urban heat island effect and, and urban cooling and that sort of thing and heat waves, as I said earlier. So that whole remote sensing field, I think is, is gonna be really critical to our ability to gather data and to use data intelligently in, in the management of our urban environment, urban environment in the future. Satellites are becoming, it's probably getting a bit crowded up, up, up in the atmosphere or the, out beyond the atmosphere, but low orbit satellites are incredibly um, numerous these days, and but they're, they're becoming, like everything uh, better and better in terms of the resolution, the, the frequency of flyover, the, the different sorts of sensors that they've got and the data that they can capture. So there's, there's definitely some, some uh, there's gonna be some uh, advantages in, in how we can utilize that in the future. Um, the other thing I think is important when we think about data for the urban environment is it's not just flow data or rainfall information. There's a whole lot of other data that that needs to be integrated to be truly smart about how we look at um, the management of our urban environment. And that's because everything sort of interacts. So everything's interconnected and everything interacts. So the, the built form, uh, the landscape, demographics, where people are, you know, being able to understand what the different land uses might be in terms of sensitive uses, whether it's schools or aged care or hospitals or um, primary health care facilities, understanding where those things are in the landscape and then being able to manage to maximise the benefits to those vulnerable or high value areas is really important as well. So I think um, that's from a built form and a, a sort of a, a human perspective, if you like. There's also ecological aspects around well, what are the ecological values of certain waterways, you know, the areas are more sensitive than others, are there particular species that we need to focus on uh, and so forth. So there's a lot greater recognition, I think, going forward around the, the importance of managing uh, the environment in urban areas. Thanks, Gordon. Um, so in terms of what, what we do with the data then, this is really about, this is where the smarts come in, if you like. Um, how, do we, how do we access information? That plot I've just shown there, or that figure I've just shown there is uh, just a screen grab from the Victorian um, state government water data site. And uh, it shows that there's a lot of info there, a lot of information. But if you go into that website, and I'm not being particularly critical of Dell because they do a great job and they supply a lot of information, but the way in which you access data and interact with data um, is in my view, you know, it really needs to be improved uh, from both from a water management uh, or water manager Point of view, but also from the community point of view, um, the the access of public uh, or the access availability of information to the public, I think needs has a long way to go. That spans across everything from rainfall weather information to flood information and uh, environmental data. The something that we've been involved with, and this is a, a concept that's been developed in the Netherlands, is called a digital delta approach, and that's really um, the principle behind that is that there's no single source of data or single point of truth that will tell you everything you need to know. Data by its very nature is dispersed and, and um, stored in different places and 
uh, under the governance of different types of authorities and so on. So there's no one single set of data that's going to answer all your questions. The real strength in um, smart water management is to gather all the information that you need, bring it together and put it in a coherent platform where you can actually um, do some analytics, value add on top of that, do some analysis and then create a, an environment where you can make smart decisions based on that. And I think the way going forward for that is definitely through a web type interface, having smart online tools with APIs that you can access and, and um, build intelligence around and, and, and hopefully get towards that, what, what really is a smart city. Thanks, Gordon. So in terms of that, that um, as I said, moving towards a, 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 an actual smart city, um, the, um, in my view anyway, that's really going from just having access to data and making data available to what are you gonna do with that data? So it's sort of, uh, I suppose in the past been described as decision support systems. Um, when I was earlier on in my career, in terms of modeling and anal analysis of data, we called it hydroinformatics. Um, these days you hear a lot more about um, yeah, analytics and um, dashboarding and that sort of thing, but it's essentially decision support systems is the same same beast. Um, but smart tools are really things, for example, like managing irrigation for plant health, um, which we do currently in terms of these irrigation systems out there, which will look at soil moisture and if there's a soil moisture deficit, to apply some water. But <clears throat> that's sort of one objective function that you might have for managing irrigation. There could be other objectives such as cooling, as I mentioned earlier, uh, heat waves are, are gonna be a, a much bigger problem into the future. And the capacity to irrigate an area, not just to make it look nice and make um, promote plant health, but you might irrigate an area to have a, a, a measurable impact on the local temperature of that zone. So there's plenty of um, research information which bears out the, the value of um, increased soil moisture and evapotranspiration in terms of reducing um, localized air temperature. There's a really interesting study um, being done in Adelaide, and I, I don't have the details of this, but I was speaking to the researcher um, a while back, and they're actually looking at um, the potential benefits of irrigating some of the areas around Adelaide Airport to reduce the temperature and um, and save on on fuel for the planes actually taking off due to the increase in air density. So um, there's things like that that you wouldn't even really think of as a potential upside to to managing um, soil moisture and evapotranspiration and air temperature. Um, there's I think there's a lot that's going, that's going to happen in that area in the future. Obviously, harvesting stormwater um, for, for reuse to reduce our, our reliance on desal, for example, and, and um, to adapt to a changing uh, water resource availability into the future. Uh, but not just harvesting stormwater for, say, irrigating an oval. Think about how you might um, intercept stormwater or, or, or store stormwater or, or retard stormwater to mitigate flooding as well. So thinking about um, uh, Southeast Water, for example, have a system called Talking Tanks, uh, and that has a distributed network of um, valves that operate on rainwater tanks within properties to maximise the impact of storage on uh, flood uh, flood volumes and flood peaks within urban catchments. I think that's an area that's definitely going to become more prominent into the future. Um, you can also use smart tools to do things like not just manage a, a particular situation at the time, whether it's a flood or so on, it might actually be something like um, uh, uh, a maintenance program, for example. So we've looked at applications where you could um, use accumulated rainfall within a catchment to predict when uh, GPT, gross pollutant trap maintenance, might need to be uh, undertaken. So look at, look at um, the pollutant load, the amount of runoff that's occurred over a period of time and say, well, after this, this much volume passing this particular location in the stormwater network, you're likely to have to, uh, to have reached 80% of your capacity or whatever it is in that GPT and you need to come in and, and clean that out rather than just having scheduled regular maintenance where um, a ver the variability in flow would mean that sometimes you go and inspect that pit and it doesn't need to be cleaned out and you've wasted your time. Um, using smarter ways to be able to um, schedule things like maintenance is, a, is an area where there can be potential um, upsides for councils, for example. And obviously things like warning and alerting, um, using our sensors and our network of information um, to, 
to inform the community, inform decision makers about it might be road closure or um, there's uh, poor water quality in a in a pond or or, or a lake, and, and so you don't want anyone to have primary contact for health reasons. Setting up um, systems where that that sort of um, notification can all happen automatically and messages sent to decision makers who can take action, but also information that can go to the public to keep them informed. Thanks, Gordon. Um, so I thought I'd just um, get into some examples um, and talk about a couple of projects and, and pieces of work that uh, I've been involved with, either directly or indirectly. Um, the first one I want to talk about is the Sponge City Brain. Um, now, this is a real-time decision support system for urban flooding and water quality that was developed for um, the city of Kun Kunshan in China. And that's a, a picture of the area there. Um, sort of, if you can see, there's a bit of an outline in the middle. <clears throat> that's the area of Kunshan. It's just to the uh, west of Shanghai. Um, and as you can imagine, uh, China is a, 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 a really heavily urbanized environment. It has uh, a lot of water management issues, a lot of water quality issues and so forth. And this particular area um, had challenge, has challenges in relation to both flooding and water quality. Uh, water technology uh, and uh, one of our um, uh, key staff was involved uh, with the CRC for Water Sensitive Cities in putting together this system for the city of Kunshan. And as I said, the, the area itself is actually, um, it, it's very flat and low lying. Uh, it's what you describe, what we we describe, um, it's actually sort of a Dutch concept, but uh, as a polder, and a polder is essentially an enclosed um, low lying area, um, usually with a levee around it and, uh, or an embankment that doesn't effectively drain by gravity. So the only way to really drain a polder, and you have a lot of these in the Netherlands where there's areas below sea level, the only way to, to effectively drain a polder is with pumping. Um, so when you have an area like that, you've got an enclosed catchment. Um, it's essentially like a large sort of retarding basin, but um, clearly you don't want it to fill up because all the people in there will flood. And so you need to manage um, your pump system and your, your drainage and channel system in order to um, minimize flood impacts. And that's that's a real challenge. Uh, a lot going along or hand in hand with that is because it's sort of an enclosed system, there's a buildup of nutrients and, or well, there can be a buildup of nutrients and, and a lot of um, eutrophied conditions in those canals and poor water quality. So the challenge is really how to best manage this series of canals and pumps and gates and so forth um, to optimize flood uh, or minimize flooding, optimize water quality, and also importantly, do that at, at sort of at a minimum cost um, because obviously running pumps and, and so on is pretty expensive. So if you can um, manage your system in a smart sort of way to achieve either the same outcome at a lower cost through the way you manage your pump systems and your gates, or potentially for the same cost, actually come up with a much better um, uh, outcome in terms of reduced flooding and, and improved water quality. Thanks, Gordon. So yeah, this is the study area that sort of Pointed that out already. You can see Kunshan there, just to the west of Shanghai. It's in the um, yeah, it's in a lowland or uh, low-lying sort of near coastal area. As I said, that's very flat. Uh, the little definition of the polder there. Hopefully, I described it vaguely accurately. Um, and on the right, this is a um, showing the uh, this particular polder and the characteristics characteristics of it. You can see the blue, light blue, or the aqua blue lines are the waterways and the water bodies. And then you've got um, wetlands distributed around there to for water quality improvement. And then there's a number of, um, there's little yellow icons or, or um, um, graphics uh, illustrate where the pumps are. So around the edge of that system, at the end of each of the canals or the, or the, the waterways, um, you have pumps that then uh, send the water over the embankment into, into the neighboring sort of drains or river or somewhere that can get away. So this is um, sort of a, a, I guess, a, a, a schematic of what the um, smart city or the sponge city brain 
looks like, and, and it's a it's um the uh, it's a particular way that this um, program is described in China in terms of the Sponge City program. It's um, we would call it water sense of urban design, but um, the, the the sort of um, symbol symbolism, if you like, of the Sponge City is very much as it as it describes. It's about um, rather than having the city as a as a hard surface where water just hits and runs off, um, creating a city that's more of a sponge that can can absorb that water and and hold it um, and 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 all the benefits that sort of flow from that. So that's sort of the symbolism around the, the idea. With the brain, the, the whole purpose of that was saying, well, let's make it smart and uh, let's have a central sort of system that can manage all these different data sources, um, opt have optimization schemes in there and manage all those um, assets to get a better outcome. So you can see the components on the left, there's weather information, monitoring data, uh, monitoring um, equipment and that catchant that's gathering um, water levels, water temperature, um, flows, um, gate status of gates and pumps, uh, all that sort of thing. You've obviously got uh, weather information in terms of rainfall, sunshine, temperature, all those sorts of things. So all that data is gathered and sent off to that central um, database. There's a web interface which enables that data display and sharing, enables the user to undertake system management and so forth. That's sort of the user interface. Then on the right side, you can see um, all that um, data that's gathered is contained within the database and it includes things like for the water quality component, the water sense of urban design treatment train. So those wetlands are included in there and the uh, impact that they have on water quality is also included as part of the processing. Uh, and then that forecasting system because there's an important component, as I said, around flooding. So you want to be able to forecast what the likely maximum height might be uh, for a particular storm when all the pumps are operating and 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 there's been drawdown or whatever it is to try and optimise the system. And then um, down that bottom right corner, the optimization component. So it's not just about um, understanding what's happening and forecasting what the conditions might be. There's this this uh, additional component of the system, which is is to actually optimize the operation of those um, uh, those those hydraulic controls to to actually get a better outcome in terms of water quality and flood uh, impacts. And this is sort of what it looks like a little bit more. Um, it's still sort of, uh, I guess, a, a, a schematic, but um, you can see here there's uh, pollutant models, there's um, hydrologic models and so forth feeding into um, the central database and work server. And that information then flows out to the user interface. And there's an image just on the right side there showing what that looks like. Now this, I, I can't, uh, unfortunately I can't read Chinese, so I can't tell you what, <laughs> what all these uh, details show, but this is just an example of the interface that was developed for the, um, uh, for the for the uh, the user or the client um, group in Kunshan, and that's giving them that ability to see uh, what's going on. There's graphs around the predicted and the optimized, and so forth. So just that typical sort of web interface where you you, you make all the data available, you make it easy to read in terms of charts, maps, and graphs, uh, and then inform the user, and then the user can make decisions around yes, well, let's go with that optimization scenario. Uh, or, or maybe know there's some other consequence, so we'll go over the different path. Thanks, Gordon. And this is just an animation which shows um, on the left is the before optimization, on the right is after. You can see at the end of the, the flood that the two, um, two images end up, this is a flooding situation. At the end, they end up at a reasonably similar situation, but you can see on the right, the actual peak, um, the peak levels are much lower than on the left, which is the, the um, non-optimized uh, version, if you like. Thanks, Gordon. The next example I want to go through quickly is the Melbourne Water Drainage Visualization and Water Control Room project. Now, this is something that uh, Water Technologies developed uh, for Melbourne Water as a, a means of uh, 
performing this data integration sort of function, if you like, across the Melbourne, the whole Melbourne water area responsibility. So it's a huge area and Melbourne Water has a lot of information, but the challenges that they faced were they had many sources of data um, and they were struggling to find a way that they could bring all that information together to, to from an operational point of view, or even just an analysis point of view to understand how their system was functioning. Um, they had a whole different, different systems which had been developed for different purposes by different groups within Melbourne Water. So whether it was the sewer operations people or the drainage people or the water supply people, everyone had sort of developed up their own data and own systems for their own purpose, but there wasn't the ability for people to share that information across the business very easily. It'd be a sort of manual download this, manual download that, stick it all in a spreadsheet, muck around trying to understand what it all meant. Really, really inefficient and um, very difficult to, to have visibility across all of those data sources and what was going on. So the challenge is really to provide that um, an interface that's accessible, not just to expert users, but to um, management and, you know, so right through the, the sort of vertical, um, vertically integrated across the business. So even if they wanted to, you know, the MD could log into this system and, um, and, and get some information useful to them about what was going on in Melbourne Water's area of responsibility. The other great thing about a bit, uh, potentially um, a web-based system is it's accessible from anywhere. So um, obviously in the, in the sort of work from home scenario that we've been in the last couple of years, that's really helpful. Also, if you're remote out in the field or somewhere, you don't necessarily have to worry about complicated um, VPN logins and that sort of stuff. You can just get on, a, anywhere you can get on a web page, you can access a web portal um, and, and get that information available to you, you know, either on your phone or sitting at the airport or wherever it is that, that you want to do it. So the solution to all this was for us to implement um, a Hydronet um, solution, and that's, I won't go into the details of Hydronet, but that's a Dutch system that uh, we work with that enables all these data sources to be pulled together and um, put into web dashboards. Thanks, Gordon. So this is just, a, I guess, a bit of a, um, uh, uh, an example of the, the challenges that Melbourne Water faced. Um, there's different, different uh, lots of different pieces of data in here. There's the FIDS um, system at the back. You've got a Hydra database. Melbourne Water had their own database internally. They would share stuff on the web. You've got the Bureau. Um, yeah, and really that leaves people a bit confused as to how, you know, what information do I get from where? Maybe go to the next one. So, um, yeah, so the, the solution in terms of um, what we've provided for Melbourne Water is, a um, what we call a water control room dashboard um, solution. And that's essentially uh, a series of customizable dashboards that can be shared between different users or different user groups. And those dashboards display the particular information that's relevant for, the, for that user or for that team. And those um, that the Hydronet set up for Melbourne Water has got access to their FID system, which is all their flood forecast information and their um, drainage uh, performance information, their Hydra database, which has, um, again, a lot of hydrographic uh, data related to waterways and, and uh, their drainage network and so forth. And it can also be, it's also connected to the Bureau of Meteorology. So all the Bureau's um, radar rainfall, all their forecast data, their now cast, their seven day um, forecast, the ADFD, that's all incorporated into the system. Um, plus, uh, I think there's things like webcams and, and all this sort of gear. There's, there's basically no end to what additional data can be plugged into the system. So it's really created a, a, a centralized sort of unifying interface for all the different sorts of data that Melbourne Water want to be able to utilize. Um, here, we've got an example of a dashboard that's been set up specifically for the city of Casey to um, highlight all the catchments that um, are relevant to the city of Casey that either within or flow through that city. And we can pull up things like, what's the rainfall over the last 24 hours? What's the rainfall predicted over the next 24 hours uh, or, or the next three days? You can then generate alerts based on that information as well. So, um, and that's really locally specific information. There's already alerts provided by the Bureau of Meteorology, for example, in relation to um, future uh, or, or, or flood watch, for example, you know, future forecast rainfall, but it doesn't go down to that catchment 
um, localized catchment level that we can with a system like this. And Melbourne Water's found this yeah, really, really helpful. Thanks, Gordon. Just an example here. Uh, this is also for Melbourne Water. This is what we call the rainfall exceedance dashboard. Um, and this is a custom, this is an example of, of where you can really become smart with your data. So this is an example of a, um, a customized analysis tool that builds on top of all that information that we've gathered together from Melbourne Water through the Hydronet platform um, in, their, in their dashboard tools. And what this application does is it looks at either a a particular point, a gauge, or an aggregated subcatchment um, layer, which uses the radar rainfall information from the Bureau of Meteorology, and then calculates either for a historic period. So it could be a week, a month, a year, 10 years in the past. You could look at that period and analyze the rainfall data for that period. It could be the current. So look at the last hour, five hours, 24 hours and also the forecast period. So all the Bureau of Meteorology forecast data, whether it's the NOWcast or the ADFD for the next seven days, you can look at that um, forecast rainfall and determine on a catchment by catchment basis, what's the likely or expected um, intensity of that particular rain event for that catchment. Uh, and what it does, you can see on the left side above the map, there's a list of um, catchment names. So Watts River, Elster Creek, so forth. And then the, the um, Across the, the top there, there's different durations. So you can see the 15, 30 minute, one hour, three, six, 12, 18, up to five days um, duration. Um, and for each of those storms, uh, for that particular period that's been selected, and I think the time here is the date here was the 15th, 11th to the 15th of October. And for those, for that particular window, that period, it's showing what the, um, uh, the peak intensity for each of those durations was uh, in each of those catchments. And then on the, over on the right, if you click on a particular location or a particular catchment, it actually plots um, the cumulative rainfall and the storm bursts. And in the bottom right-hand corner, that's an IFD, um, plots the, the cumulative rainfall against the IFD curve. So you can actually see straight away if um, whether that event was, uh, say a five or a 10 year event or, or, or what it might've been. And that's really helpful for data analysis for understanding in the past what's happened in particular areas and what the impact of floods might've been. You can also look at effectively use as a predictive tool to say, well, we think we're gonna get a, a, a 50 year storm in the next four hours in this particular catchment. And that um, then enables management actions to occur there. So a re really good example of sort of value add on top of um, the information. Thanks, Gordon. So I think where to from here? Um, the, in terms of um, really, you know, smart cities is a bit of a term that's bandied around quite a bit, I think. And I don't think we're really quite there yet. Um, there's a lot of potential uh, and there's a lot of um, thoughts around how we can become smarter, but I think there's still quite a way to go for, for some of those things to be implemented. Um, and what we really need in order to do that is have better integrated data networks. So um, grab the information that we've got available from different sources, pull it together and add new data sources such as remote sensing I mentioned before, get the IoT device network sort of working and, and get that information coming in. The crowdsource data that I also mentioned earlier, find out what are the most useful sort of sources of that and, and somehow integrate that into our decision-making framework as well. It's then a matter of, um, in order, in order for us to be smart about it, we need to understand what we're trying to achieve and what tools we need to, to, to get us there. Um, I think web platforms are definitely the go, um, building in that custom functionality that allows different user groups to get the information they need to make their decisions. That's, that's when we can really leverage all the information we have and become, uh, I think, more, more nuanced in our approach to, to water management in terms of holding things where we need to hold it in, letting it go when we need to let it go, increase treatment when, when it's needed, irrigate when it's gonna give the most benefit, um, all these sorts of things um, in relation to the, to the urban water system. And um, having these systems in an interactive sort of fashion so that 
we, we cannot just observe what's going on, but actually game, you know, and, and look at, well, what if we do this or what do we do that? The, the similar way to what the Bureau do, they run ensembles of forecasts and, and then pick the one they think that's most uh, most likely to occur. So um, I think that's really, really the way of the future. I think that's my last slide, good. Yeah, thanks for that, Warwick. I just spoke to Richard um, and he's still having troubles. Um, so it sends his apologies. He won't be able yep. to join us today. So I'll, I'll just whip through his slides quickly. So um, on the right, there, there's a photo of the UNESCO uh, 17 Sustainable Development Goals. Um, so talk about the work required to deliver Smart City Nirvana. Um, organisations need to have a clear strategy that encompasses their goals and how they measure their success at all levels. Um, people sometimes don't know what they need to measure, so it needs to be worked out. Um, collaboration is pivotal between a variety of organisations um, to be able to use the infinite functionality. Um, careful des design is required to enable management to use IoT to achieve operational efficiencies and reduce uh, environmental impact. Um, and then, yeah, sort of working out the needs. This is sort of a, a Hydra Terra um, schematic table that we use. Um, so, initially, it's about the design, so the system, system design and system specification. Um, and it's about the supply, so system supply, configure and test, system install. Um, and then we work down to operate, so the system oversight. Um, maintenance, uh, reporting, and also training. And then uh, we worked into the monitoring activities. Uh, it's about managing um, the resources and logistics of the monitoring programs and also um, collecting, so field measurements, um, sourcing third party data sheets. Um, it's also about site data management and then also finally reporting. Um, and what's needed to make it happen. Um, so yeah, essentially we've got a wealth of different types of sensors as Warwick was talking about before. Um, so we need people who can integrate these sensors, um, functionality, functionality to, to federate from multiple clouds. So you bring in multiple systems together, um, ability to write APIs and scripts, uh, network management tools, uh, software to allow us to track assets and their status. Um, we need alarms in these um, sensors if something's going wrong. So our team's notified and um, can have a apply technical support when it's needed. Um, we need the instrumentation technicians and the IT specialists to support those systems. And so we need um, training uh, to train support teams with knowledge of sensors to learn train software. And so we need consultants to design the information outputs to meet stakeholder needs, and then data specialists who can take our IoT outputs and produce meaningful data visualizations aligned with the consultant um, identified management needs. Um, so this is a hydrogen job at Point Lonsdale, um, and it's just an automatic gate that open and close um, with high and low tide. So it, um, means there's yeah, water circulation through there. And there's another case study at the Melbourne Zoo that Hydrotera is involved in um, real-time monitoring of their vegetation to improve water efficiency. So we see we've got soil moisture probes there um, hooked up to telemetry, um, a data logger of telemetry, and then we've got the solar power, which um, supplies the power for the logger. Um, webinar takeaways. So what we've learnt um, from Warwick, the challenges are increasing. So growing population and intensification of land use, um, causing increasing stress on urban landscapes. And these uh, impacts are also compounded by climate change. And the data needs to be used. Um, so harnessing the right data at the right time is essential for better planning. And utilising data correctly can result in both real-time and predictive control. And also yeah, collaboration is key. So we need collaboration between organisations 
um, which is vital to achieve full capabilities of integrated systems. Um, synergies are required from sensor all the way through to data visualization. Um, and we had a few early bird questions, so thank you to everyone who gave us them. Um, Warwick, are you able to tackle these? I, I can have a go, uh, definitely. <laughs> so in terms of um, our technology ties back to sustainable development goals, I think um, there's not necessarily a direct um, link there, but certainly um, the better information and technology we have in terms of managing um, the surface water in our urban environment, then then hopefully that can lead us to a more um, you know more sustainable outcome in terms of meeting those goals, whether it's you know the goals to do with health and and um, um, water you know, healthy um, use of water resources and and all those you know there's a number of those goals in there which I think will be supported by the use of technology in a in a in a sort of sustainable way. So. I think it's vital that we have have better access and tools to to manage uh, to manage that. The second one, in terms of achieving ANZEC um, compliance, then uh, definitely you, know, you can't sort of you can't demonstrate compliance without measurements. So um, those data networks are really important. The sensors, having the right sensors in the right locations. Um, is really important. There's obviously cost limit, cost sort of constraints, if you like, on data networks. So it's being, I think the key there is being um, clever around how you're using your best um, gathering and, and, and using your, your data measurements to demonstrate that compliance. Um, and whether there's <clears throat> in the future, the ability to, to sort of, um, use some of these other methods such as as remote sensing and so on to augment um, in situ point sort of point source um, measurements. One of the challenges of of any sort of point um, measurement is that it doesn't tell you necessarily anything about what's happening spatially. And if you're talking about a waterway or a water body, then sometimes you want to know more than just what's happening at a single point. Uh, what, what do we consider when undertaking urban or river creek restoration? Well, I think there's a lot of things to consider. Um, there's what one of the really important things is to um, consider what you want to achieve. What what's the outcome that you're looking for? Because um, urban environments are generally you know, highly disturbed, highly modified, highly degraded. And um, so in terms of what, what you want to get out of a restoration or a, uh, process is really important to define that before you before you launch into it. Are you looking for, um, and, and to be honest, I think a lot of urban waterway management or restoration is around amenity for, for human benefit, um, not necessarily the environment, but you, you may want to enhance a particular environment for, you know, the, for example, in um, Mumbolt Creek and Fernie Creek, um, there's I know there's a focus on um, platypus habitat. So you might you might really want to focus your restoration around what do you need to do to enhance that particular habitat in terms of the physical form and the revegetation and the and the um, ecological vegetation, so classes and so on that that you would put into that. And also you might be wanting to exclude ex actually exclude um, p uh, p people's access to those areas for the for the benefit of um, particular species but yeah it just depends I think you really got to have a goal in mind of what you're trying to achieve and be realistic about that and then it can drive your um, restoration design the latest regulatory perspective on these recycled water from pipe retailers third pipe system um, this is kind of not my direct specialty I'd have to say recycled water but um, I think there's still a little way to go from a regulatory framework perspective around integrated water management in general, um, because the big sort of elephant in the room with with integrated water management is um, is is sort of reuse to potable, um, particularly stormwater reuse to potable. There's um, plenty of stormwater harvesting schemes 
have been put in place for irrigating council ovals and things like that, for example. Um, but um, there's really nothing out there that, that, that that's seriously contemplating going from um, stormwater to potable use. And unfortunately, that if we want to have really large scale stormwater harvesting schemes in place, then we've got to find a use for that water. And in the urban area, um, the most obvious use is is potable substitution. So um, that's yeah, we're just we're just not there yet with the regulatory framework for that. But I, I expect that's something that's going to evolve over the next decade. Um, I'm less on top of recycled water from treatment plants. Clearly, that's that's um, pretty advanced in terms of the, tr the tertiary treatment standards and um, what's required for different uses in terms of primary contact and so forth. And the third pipe systems that are quite extensive through a lot of the um, greenfield urban areas where third pipe systems have been put in for, for garden use and toilet flushing. I think that's pretty well bedded down, but it's, the, it's, it's what we're gonna do from the point of view of um, uh, harvesting storm, what I think we've still got a way to go. Uh, collation interpretation of real-time data. Um, this is certainly an interesting one. Um, there's, there are issues in terms of accessing real-time information. Um, those sorts of, um, you sort of latency issues around how long does it take to, to get data from uh, a collection point through a telemetry network or whatever it might be through to a, um, a receiver and then into a database and then you, do you need to quality check it and how to use it and so forth. Um, there's, I think we're getting better at that um, in terms of the Bureau of Meteorology information and Melbourne Water information, for example, that, that stuff's all online and able to be incorporated into, you know, we've got that in our uh, Melbourne Water dashboard application, for example. Um, yeah, I think the key there really is um, how you access and um, combine that that real time um, data and into a useful uh, interface that you can do something with. Because real time data is only really used to you if it's in an ingestible form that makes sense that you can do something about. Otherwise, um, if you're not able to really do anything with it, well. It, it's, it might be nice to look at, but it's not helping you that much. A good example of that, I think, is uh, radar rainfall. So um, the Bureau of Meteorology radar images are pretty ubiquitous. Everyone would just about uh, looks at their phone pretty regularly when there's storms on. You can go and look at those coloured maps and you can see, oh, there's a storm coming, but it doesn't actually tell you how much rain there's going to be. Uh, whereas um, Melbourne Water has utilisation of a system and the Bureau does this, but that it's not necessarily readily publicly available. They have calibration of that rainfall data in real time, and you can access that data. And, and we bring up grids in Hydronet, for example, where you can click on a, poly, a, a, a pixel, and it'll tell you actually how much rainfall is there and how much is um, predicted in the next three hours. So um, the key is turning that data into something useful that you can then make a decision based on. Uh, Problems with algae in urban lakes, ways to mitigate this. Well, algae in urban lakes is generally uh, uh, resulting from eutrophication, which is an excess of nutrients in that system beyond what it's got the natural capacity to absorb. So um, that's primarily in, in, in urban areas, that's due to a high nutrient runoff from urban land use. And that might be from you um, from your streets and, and private um, lots, but it can also be from things like golf courses or areas that might have high application of fertilizer and then results in um, high nutrient runoff into those sorts of areas. Um, the mitigation for that is really pretreatment of that water before it gets into the lake to try and strip nutrients out. Um, the other thing that we do is Melbourne Water has essentially turned all the lakes into wetlands and, and increased the productivity of those so that there's more nutrient uptake from the macrophytes, the emergent macrophytes in those water bodies to sort of try and take some of that nutrient out of the, of the, the water column. Um, but the key yep. thing is really improve our, try not to generate the nutrients in the first place. So treat that at source. Um, and then, uh, and then if you can't do that, then have, stormwater treatment measures such as wetlands 
um, biofiltration systems, rain gardens, um, grass swales, all those sorts of wizard treatments that can pre-treat urban stormwater before it actually gets into a lake and causes that eutrophication problem with the algae growth. And number seven, real-time stormwater quality assessment and scope for large-scale first flush. And pollution. I'm just trying to work out what that means. Um, so I guess that's really asking, is there, a, is there scope for improving stormwater quality through um, first flush pollution diversion systems? Now, I assume what um, this person may be getting at is the first flush is something People might be familiar with it in terms of rainwater harvesting systems into a rainwater tank at a lot scale, where, where the first bit of water that runs off the roof or whatever hard surface that you're capturing from um, gets diverted out of the system and doesn't go into your rainwater tank because it, the notion that notionally the idea is, and this is backed up by data, is that first bit of runoff can be quite high in, in nutrients and pollutants. So you basically eject that and then let the rest of the water go into your rainwater tank so you improve the water quality in your tank. At a macro scale, you could theoretically do this for a whole stormwater system by um, ejecting that first part of the stormwater runoff um, either into some sort of um, holding pond or infiltration system, or maybe even into the sewer. Um, you know, that that's one option is you that that area of greater pollution, you could actually put that into the sewer. Now, I'm not suggesting you want to do this because that's actually illegal, but if if um if if Melbourne Water and Councils had a had an agreement to do something like this. So you could potentially um, divert something like that into, say, the sewer system where it would go off and get treated, and then the water um, stormwater that came after that could could go into um, into a pond for reuse or, or some other sort of purpose. But I'm not I, I'm not aware of any proposal to sort of tackle that as a as a obvious um, uh, solution to to stormwater quality. I think there's probably better ways, more natural systems we could use. Um, to you know, through wetlands and bioretention systems to treat that first flush. But that's my go at those questions anyway. Awesome, thanks for that, Warwick. Uh, I think we've used up our hours, so we might leave it there. Um, oh, so we're kind of here conducting a trading needs survey at the moment. So I think Gleadson's going to post a link in the chat. Um, so yeah, help us tackle the skills shortage in environmental monitoring. Um, it's just a short, quick survey. So if you've got some time, would appreciate if you had a go at that. Um, and there's some contact details of uh, Richard and Warwick, if you'd like anything followed up or any further questions. Um, but yeah, that will leave it there. Thanks again, Warwick. Thanks for helping us out and joining us. That was awesome. And um, yeah, we'll hopefully see all you guys next year again. Thanks, Gordon. Thanks, everyone. Yeah.